So thanks everybody for joining us for this is episode 11 of As the Prop Turns. And uh, as you probably know, Glenn is gonna give a presentation today. Andrew's gonna introduce him in just a second. We pre-recorded Glenn's presentation. So after we do the intros, we're gonna let that roll and then we'll come back live for uh, question, answers and discussion after that. So I'm gonna introduce our team really quickly. Um, we have Jeff Mesmer, our VP of Fluid Motion. Morning. We have Andrew Custis, our General Manager for Fluid Motion. Good morning. And Kenny Mars, our Customer Service Manager for Fluid Motion. Morning. I'm just going to get rid of the Fluid Motion part. I think that goes without saying. Tim Bates, Delivery Captain, Certified Volvo Technician. Morning. Uh, normally, we'd have Brian Decott here, but he is under the weather today, so he's not going to join us. We miss him. And uh, new this episode is Shane Kwaterski, our Director of Business Development. Good morning, guys. And my name's Sam Visit. I'm the Marketing Director, and uh, I'm going to pass it over to Andrew to introduce our special guest. Okay, so Glenn, Glenn Wagner, we... Uh... We all met uh, Glenn. Uh, it was uh, at the 2014 uh, Seattle Boat Show where he uh, ordered a brand new Ranger 25 SC. And uh, we knew we knew Glenn was uh, right away probably one of the nicest guys any of us have uh, come across, which we're not making that up. And we say it to him all the time. And if you know Glenn, you would agree. But um, he put 3,000 hours on that Ranger Tug 25 SC, uh, including a trip to Alaska um, before 2018 when he ordered a Ranger 29 from us, which he currently has close to 400 hours on, uh, all single-handing. So Glenn, Glenn uh, doesn't, he really nice guy. He does not really like people, I think, uh, because he doesn't visit marinas. He anchors out. Uh, if you see him, your your chances are he's going to be uh, on an anchorage. I found out, or in an anchorage, right around. Did you say Susha, Glenn? Was that right? Or yeah, oh, around Anna Corv. Yeah, Susha. And <laughs> yeah. I I don't Not. think that was true. <laughs> um, but he's also done training with uh, over a hundred fluid motion boats, and uh, very very experienced and the the right guy. So I'm excited. Uh, to watch this as well. So thank you, Glenn. Okay, you're welcome. Yeah. So I almost forgot our intro. We gotta we gotta play the intro video. <laughs> yeah. Couldn't go without that. <laughs> Brought to you today by Ranger Tugs, Cutwater Boats, and Solara Boats. Quality cruising, real community. So here's just kind of an overview of what we'll be looking at. Again, uh, we're going to do the basic anchoring, the 101 anchoring, if you will, about just deploying, setting, and retrieving the anchor. And then we're going to go into some more uh, advanced topics regarding anchoring. I'm going to look at uh, making sure your ground tackle, which is your, your anchor, the chain, the line that holds everything together, attaches the anchor to your boat, and by the way, the line and the chain are also known as road, and I'll be using that term. We're going to talk about what scope is. And then in red, I have calculating road length. And this is one of the most common mistakes I've seen by people anchoring is they don't properly calculate road length. And as a result, the anchor doesn't hold to the bottom very well, and you'll see them drifting away from where they intended to stay anchored. Uh, we'll talk about the term swing, which you need to understand in order to determine where to drop the anchor. 
I read everything that comes uh, across my computer on anchoring. I've looked in books, whatnot. And the topic of where to drop the anchor is not covered very well. And I'm going to talk about some tools and techniques that I've developed and I'm not seeing them anywhere. I'm sure someone else has figured it out in there, are using them, but it's just not something you see very often. So uh, anyways, even uh, I presented this at Yacht Clubs and even old salts who have forgotten more about anchoring I'll ever know weren't aware of some of, of, of things they have on the boat that really make the whole challenge of determining where to drop the anchor make that much less challenging. So let's get into it. So anchoring 101, deploying, setting, and retrieving the anchor. Deploying the anchor, you approach your intended anchor drop location. You approach it while going into the wind and current. Then you stop at the intended anchor drop location. When I say stop, I mean really stop the boat. Half reverse a couple of times, make sure you are stopped. Uh, this is really important because what you want to do is have the wind and current start to move you backwards. Uh, so once you stop, create a waypoint. You'll be using this for setting your anchor alarm. And on our Garmin chart plotters, you can just simply use the mark function to set a waypoint. Just note the water depth and you'll calculate the amount of road that you need to deploy. And again, road is the combination of anchor line, the anchor rope, and the chain. So you begin lowering the anchor and you wanna make certain that your boat is moving rearwards. Generally, almost all the time, wind to current will be moving your boat rearwards. If it's not, you can use a little reverse power quickly in and out of reverse gear because what you don't want to allow to happen is have the chain stack up on top of the anchor. So we've, we've stopped, created a waypoint, we've noted the depth, calculated, hey, how much line we need to let out and we'll get, we'll go way down that rabbit hole in some later slides. But anyways, we determined how much we want to let out. We've lowered it while the boat's going rearwards because we don't want to stack the chain on top. Once all the road is deployed, we cleat it. Now the road will probably not be nice and in a straight line back. We let it out at a little faster rate than uh, what it can be stretched back for, but we want it once the appropriate amount has been deployed, cleat it off. Do not want to rely on your windlass to hold that anchor line all night long. It will not work. So uh, clean it. So now we need to set it. It's all laid out. The appropriate amount of line is out. It's cleated, but still allow the boat to drift rearwards aft until the boat st uh, stopped rearward motion. And when that happens, you'll see, feel the bow or see the bow swing right that round and point towards the anchor. And then we need to begin setting the anchor because right now it's just sitting on top of the sea floor. We need to start setting it by slowly backing up in the direction that the wind and current was pushing us. And when you want to do that very slowly going in and out of reverse gear till the road, the anchor line and chain are uh, under a, a string. If we do it too quickly, what'll happen is the anchor won't dig down into the bottom, it'll just skitter along the top surface, uh, depending on what the, the surface is. If, it, if it's a uh, clay or something a little bit firm, it'll just get her in and not dig in. So very, very slowly, give it a chance to dig in. And we finish that setting by keeping the boat in reverse and the anchor set when the boat comes to a full stop while it is in reverse. I use GPS speed on my chart flyer to tell me when it is set. It will go down to zero knots, even though the boat is in reverse gear. The proper way, the traditional way of doing it is you look, for instance, at two trees on shore and make sure there's not relative motion between a one tree that's behind the other tree. But I have found over nine years extensively anchoring that my GPS speed is very accurate. And that's been true even when I've been in deep fjords where I have limited satellite signals providing info to my GPS. It still worked really, really well. When it sticks on zero, I'm stopped and the anchor set. Uh, so now we return the shifter to neutral 
and we set an anchor alarm. I recommend using a cell phone app just because there's no drain on your battery, very little using your cell phone. And we use the anchor drop location waypoint that we set when we drop the anchor. We use that latitude and longitude for the uh, anchor alarm. And this is sort of an animation of what mine looks like. It happens to be the Anchor Pro app. It's important to note that cell service or internet are not required. You just need a phone that has GPS, and I believe they all do. Uh, you do need to disable the phone's auto off function iPhones, I know, have uh, in the settings, you can do that. I know with Androids, there's an app that allows you to disable the auto off function. The, uh, so now we've had a, a great night or two anchoring, been entertained by the wildlife, and but it's time to retrieve the anchor. So what we do in order to retrieve it is we slowly approach the anchor using the windlass to retrieve the road, but we need to avoid overworking the windlass. We also need to avoid allowing slack line to entangle the prop, and we want to make sure we don't use our thruster while we're doing this because they, the, thruster, the bow thruster will just suck that line right in and do damage to our anchor line and to the windlass. So we're using forward gear to slowly approach using a windlass to pull in the excess road. We have crew on the foredeck. They operate the windlass. That's my preferred method. They use hand signals to let the captain know if he needs to go, you know, put it into gear, if he needs to take it out of gear, if he needs to turn. He, the captain from the helm station, is not able to see where the line is going over what direction the anchor is in so the crew on the foredeck can help him understand that with hand signals to uh, unstick the anchor just pull in all the anchor line and the boat will then be positioned directly over the anchor i have found that 99 out of 100 times it will just once you're over top of it it'll easily just pull up and you can just use the little windlass to pull it up to the boat. If it's really stuck, you can recleat the road, swing the boat around so it's a stern is facing away from the direction it was last set in, the anchor was last set in, and uh, just gently pull it in that opposite direction, and it will come up. If you're anchoring in an area with a lot of debris, that can be around real populated areas because they used to just throw refrigerators and cars and all sorts of stuff just offshore. Or uh, when I'm exploring areas up in the Brightons or further north, I will uh, install my anchor retrieval device uh, that allows you, if the anchor is caught on debris that's not coming up, it allows you to retrieve your anchor and line up. And you can go online and find... Uh, a variety of devices, some very simple and some more complicated, but uh, it's a good idea to install an anchor retrieval device. Okay, so now let's go into some of the more advanced techniques and things you need to do. Preparing your ground tackle, you need to a safety wire, the shackle. There's a, there's a little uh, pin that holds the anchor chain to the anchor goes through the shackle. Really good idea to have some sort of a locking device. I use stainless wire. Some people use high quality plastic wire ties. Just something to keep this pin from being able to unravel. The other thing, absolutely critical, you cannot anchor properly without it, is to mark your road with road markers, which will allow you to know how far out you let the anchor deploy. Very important. These are the ones I use. There's little tabs go through. I anchor so much, I wore the numbers right off. I just reapply them with an indelible link. But you need to you need to mark that. Otherwise, you don't know if you have enough out or if you have too much out and you're in front of the anchor anchorage, you're going to swing into another boat. So uh, another item we're going to look at is scope. And the reason we need to be mindful of scope is because anchors are designed to be pulled on a small angle. 
That's the only way they work. When I mentioned I see a lot of problem, well, the problems I see are generally because people did not put enough anchor line out. So you need to be mindful of the scope, and I'll explain that in a little more detail, but basically understand it's critical that you are pulling on a relatively small angle. The anchor was designed to dig in when it's being pulled on a relatively small angle. You want to be on the boat named Secure. You don't want to be on the boat named Drifter. If you have a large angle here, then there's a tendency for the anchor to become dislodged and the boat to drift out where the wind and current are taking it. Very important. So scope is actually a ratio. It's a ratio of the length of the road to the distance to the bottom. It's expressed as a ratio. Five to one happens to be the scope that I found works well for me, my boat, and my ground tackle. What that means, the five to one, is five feet of road for every foot of distance from where the road goes over the bow to the bottom during maximum tide. It is not just the water depth, and I'll explain that in a little more detail here. So in order to determine the distance to the bottom, we need to take a look at the distance from where the anchor roller is, where the line comes over the bow to the water surface. We need to know that, and you can go determine that with your boat right now. Take a measuring tape out and, and measure that, and that becomes a constant that you can use in this calculation. Also know the water depth at the point that we drop the anchor, and that we simply get off of our depth sounder at the point when we're dropping the anchor. And then we need to take into account expected tidal increase. How much is the tide going to go up while we are anchored? And in a lot of areas, that's a relatively small number, but you want to get proficient at understanding that for when you're anchoring in areas where there's a wide anchorage. I'm heading up to Alaska in May, and I'll be in areas where that number will be 25 feet. It's really considerable how much the tide is going to go up from the time I drop my anchor until I pull it back up again. So it's something you want to take into account. How do you do that? You simply pull up uh, the embedded graph that's in our chart plotters, and you look at from the time I plan to arrive at my anchorage until the time I plan to uh, leave, how much is the tide, what's the maximum it's going to go up? While I'm looking at that, I also take a look and say, hey, how much is it going to go down? I want to be mindful of that because I want to make sure I anchor in enough depth that the boat will still be swimming while the uh, tide goes down or after the tide goes down. I don't want to be sitting on the bottom. We look at that, and in this example, for the amount of time, it might be overnight, it might be a couple of days, in this example, looking at that graph, I know that when I arrive at 2.30, and I can do this well ahead of time before arriving there, I estimate when I'm going to arrive, and I look at this graph that's in our chart planners and says at 2.30, in that tidal swing up and down, you're going to be at the five-foot level, and while you're staying there, it's going to increase up to 12 feet from five feet to 12 feet, and it's going to go down to one foot. So it's going to go up seven feet and down four feet. So what I do is I take those numbers, and again, this is before I even arrive, and if, when I've been out anchoring, you'll see my little pad of paper has got for every time I anchor, I've got one of these little charts set here. I always note the time that I had planned on arriving in case that changed. The depth that when I arose uh, uh, based off of that graph, what it's going up, what it's going down, and the increase and the decrease. So now, going back to my road lake calculation, we already knew that this was four or five feet, whatever it is. The depth sounder told us we're in 20 feet of water. And now I have the seven foot depth to say, hey, I need to calculate for the tide going up seven feet or 20 feet or whatever it's going to be going up based off of the established graph that's embedded in our chart plot. So knowing that I have 32 feet 
even though I'm only in 20 feet of water, I need to calculate for 32 feet times my scope of five to one, I need to let out 160 feet of road, even though I'm only in 20 feet of water. This again is a common error made, and it's a reason why you'll see people get in their dinghy, go off to shore, and watch their boat slowly drift away from where they had anchored. Swing is a term you need to understand. So now that we've let out 160 feet of road, understand that while we're staying there for the night or for the couple of days, we need to make sure we've accommodated an anchor drop location that will accommodate a circle, a space with a 160 foot radius. And we can want to make sure that this space is clear of obstacles, shallow areas, and so we need to be mindful of the swing. Now we're gonna get into determining exactly where to drop the anchor and why are we gonna do that? And the reason is not all anchorages are like this. This happens to be one of my favorite anchorages. It's up near uh, Shearwater in the Bella Bella area. It's there's no other boats there. On this particular day, I had a true double rainbow. Sam did not Photoshop that in. And it's a nice mud bottom, constant 25 foot depth, minor tides, uh, just an awesome place. And when you're at a place like this, you don't need to have a lot of tools to figure out how to anchor. It's, it becomes very easy. However, you can go be in some real challenging areas. This happens to be Echo Bay on Susha Island during COVID when everyone was anchored there. And you can see in this white area, Every one of these little blips is a boat anchored in the bay. And so I come in here, this is my boat, and I'm looking around like, where in the world do I anchor? And that can be very difficult to determine that I have adequate clearance from other boats, that I have adequate clearance from shore. And so let's take a look at some tools that we have in our chart plotter that allow us to do that very easily. We're going to talk about tools and techniques. And again, you don't always need to use all these tools or any of them. Um, they can be used individually, combination, or use, you know, all of them. But I don't want you to get the impression that anchoring is this very complicated process. I'm just using a very, very complex, difficult example in order to show how you use the tools. Anchoring is not this difficult every time you anchor. The tools are tracks, that's often referred to as breadcrumb trails. All of our Berman chart plotters have that, and now they're chart plotters as well. Waypoints, we can set those by just hitting the bark function and it'll set a waypoint right where our boat is, or we can touch anywhere on the chart plotter screen. Uh, a little menu item comes up, it's basically asks you, do you want to create a waypoint? And you just touch it and you've created a waypoint somewhere other than where your boat is located, the radar overlay chart to help them determine where to drop the anchor, and the distance measuring tool, which again, all of our Garmin chart plotters uh, have that. So we're, now we're going to show you how to use these tools to determine where to drop the anchor. And again, it's a very challenging scenario I'm using. We're going to be near shore, got to be very mindful of not getting too shallow. I've got obstacles that I don't want the boat to swing over, and it's really crowded. There's a bunch of other boats around. Again, unusual, but it'll make for a good example. Okay, so now we'll go in and look at an example of how to use the, um, these tools for determining where to drop the anchor. What I do is I have my sonar is always displayed and I will survey the area, paying attention to the depths. And I like to do kind of a circle in the area that I, I think I want to anchor. And you'll see me when I'm doing these anchoring uh, explorations, going in these circles. I have a friend who has watched me doing this and he told me, you remind me of my golden retriever looking for a place to relieve itself. And it, I'm fine with that because I'm just trying to survey the area, make sure it's, it's going to give me nice, secure, safe place to drop my anchor. I also make sure I have my tracks on in order to 
know what area I've surveyed. I usually try to go about as close to shore as I would be comfortable swinging in uh, to make sure that when I drop my anchor, it's far enough away from this track I've left so that I don't get into shallow areas. I also use waypoints to identify the location of things like crab pot floats or mooring buoys. So I will set those on my chart plotter just by uh, set, simply setting waypoints and having them there, knowing that they're areas that I want to make sure my boat is not going to swing over. So what I've done is kind of created an uh, uh, animation of what my chart plotter screen looks like. So this, think of this as my chart plotter screen. Here's my tracks I've left. Here's the waypoints I've created. And I'm starting to build a picture of the area I'm thinking about anchoring in. And remember there was some land, the, the shore was right over here. So I know this area of my tracks, I don't want to make sure I'm not going to swing beyond it. So I'm I'm developing a nice picture in this very complicated, difficult area to anchor. Next thing I do is I make sure my radar is on and I use my radar overlay chart in order to identify the boats that I'm near and, and have them displayed on my chart plotter. So again, I've animated that in here. So these red blobs are other boats that are in the area. So now I'm starting to get a really good picture of area I, I'm going to be anchoring in. But I need to know what are the distances to these boats. It's I'm absolutely amazing how the size of the boat really throws off your perception of how far away it is. If you have a small boat and a large boat here, the large boat always looks a lot closer than the small boat. So having a way to measure how far away those different boats are is very useful. And fortunately, our chart plotters have a measuring tool embedded right in it. I found a lot of people are not aware of this, so I'm going to just show you what it looks like. This happens to be on the Garmin, and I'm sure other chart plotters have the same thing. In this example one here, all you need to do is simply touch anywhere on your chart plotter, and in the upper corner, a little screen pops up, an embedded screen pops up, gives you information about that place you just touched. One of the pieces of information it provides is the distance away from your boat that you touched on the chart plotter. Very, very useful. In addition, another option pops up and it allows you to measure between two points that are, don't include your boat. And you just set a reference. In this case, I'm going to set it on one of those boats radar returns. And then I can drag over to another boat and I can see how far apart they are. So this is a very convenient tool. I use it all the time for a lot of reasons. And just make sure you have it, know that it's there. It becomes very useful when you're determining where to drop the anchor. So again, this is the way it works. From my boat, I just simply touch the radar return touch my track line and up in the upper corner, the distance away, uh, the distance to this boat, the distance to this line when I touch the line to this other boat pops right up and I know exactly how far away those objects are. The waypoint I set, I can just touch that waypoint and the distance from where my boat is located will pop up into that little screen. In addition, I can go a little deeper with that measuring tool and I'm able to measure the distance from one boat to another boat and have that displayed. I'll know how far apart those boats are and I can start to, even though this boat looks a lot closer, it's so big that I can find out, hey, I'm, this is about the halfway point. I thought it was way over here. So it gives you really good, solid, hard data on the distances. So let's pull this all together and I'm going to explain it in words and then I'll just show you with an anim my animation, if you will, on how to determine where to drop the anchor. And again, this is a worst case scenario, but it does show you how all the tools can work together. So we use uh, tracks to mark out the area that we've surveyed. We've used waypoints to identify 
objects. We've uh, estimated our swing area. In our example, it was 160 feet. So I know I need to pick a point that's 160 feet from that area where the sun's getting really shallow. When you have chart plotted a uh, measuring tool to allow us to measure our distance to the tracks, our distance to other boats, and the distance to obstacles. And using this information, we can choose an anchor drop location and create a waypoint at that location. So wait, this is me doing that. This is my screen that I've created by creating the tracks, by creating waypoints for things that don't show up on radar. I have a radar so I can see the boats that do show up on radar. And I've just done a bunch of measuring really quick. You just touch the screen and boom, there's your measurement. Uh, it's not real complicated. And I, from the, creating this picture, I can now have a really good idea in this challenging anchor drop location in terms of where I want to place a waypoint for my anchor drop location. And we have now accomplished the most difficult part of anchoring in a very difficult situation by simply using the tools that we already have embedded in our chart plotter to create that waypoint. And that's, that's all there is. And now if there's any questions, we can field those. So definitely saw some questions about solo anchoring, which you're probably the authority to answer those. Any tips on uh, solo anchoring, Glenn? Yeah, I do a lot of solo anchoring. Uh, the way I do it is I go out on the bow, uh, uh, to drop the anchor, I'm just trying to think of something that's really unique. The, the concern is overworking the windlass when you're solo anchoring. So you may need to go uh, back in and, uh, and uh, help the boat go forward. Uh, although most of the time, uh, if you're in a secure anchorage, the wind and current are not uh, so severe that the windlass, you can't pull the boat forward. Uh, and again, I, I try to monitor that, but uh, uh, yeah, doing it solo uh, uh, is really not an issue. Make sure you wear your uh, personal flotation device because you are walking up, uh, you know, to the bow. Um, reason for doing that uh, when I'm deploying the anchor, I want to make sure the road's coming out nice and smooth. When I'm uh, bringing it in, um, I want to make sure, uh, especially when the chain starts coming in. Uh, depending on uh, which locker you have, sometimes you need to knock over that little uh, mountain of chain uh, to keep from blocking uh, where the wind list is uh, dropping the chain inside the locker. Uh, but it, it really is, is not an issue. One of the real main concerns people have when solo anchoring is there's a fear of uh, while you're pulling up the anchor and making your way back to the helm station about you drifting back. Uh, and I've actually done some experimenting with that, measuring uh, how far you drift by using my tracks, you know. And even when I had substantial current, uh, because you pulled your boat forward all the way up to the anchor, I've found I always have plenty of time to get back to the helm uh, in order to, uh, you know, move the boat away from shore or other boats. Uh, I've had plenty of time to do that. So it, it really is not a bad, it, it's an easy thing to do. I do suggest going out to an open area, practice, uh, leave your tracks on so you can see exactly how much your boat has been moving around uh, while you're uh, up on the bow and the anchor is no longer holding you in position. Hey, Glenn, did you, did, do you anchor with a swivel? You put a swivel on your... Uh, I, I don't. I've gone both ways. I uh, I tend to be really cautious. Uh, it also depends on what anchor you're using, because some anchors really want to spin when you're bringing them up. Um, I uh, haven't had to uh, do that. Um, sometimes I do need to allow my anchor to just hang to get the twist out of it. Uh, and if you are going to use a swivel, make sure you have a really... Uh, a uh, robust one. I believe it's Ultra makes one. Uh, I've installed on several boats for people and it's uh, it's very robust. So, uh, but uh, no, I just uh, really watch my chain as I'm pulling it up to make sure I'm not putting a lot of twist in it. 
the other thing is if you take your uh, your line off to mark the road, uh, that's a place where people put a lot of twist into their chain as they're handling it. I've seen them just getting really twisted up. Uh, and while I'm mentioning that, if you are gonna mark the road, uh, make sure you don't lay out the chain on a cement dock. Uh, that zinc coating on a chain is not real thick. So I, I just put it, my uh, chain and line in a car, go up to a grassy area to spread it out uh, just because I don't want to damage that very relatively delicate zinc coating that's on the chain. That, yeah, I think the question that about the swivel was how do you smooth out the chain and the locker? And I think that's two things. It's like you said, letting it twist, you know, untwist itself, yeah. but also what you said earlier, which was stacking in the locker, you got to you got to move it out of the way, right? For the yeah. rest of the chain and road to come in. When yeah. you're in there, when you're bringing it up, you just, do you start that with the road and push it out of the way or you just do the chain? Yeah, I, I do. Uh, uh, and again, you don't want to, sometimes I may be a little bit over cautious, but I do like pulling the road to one side uh, so that that chain is not stacked on top of it. Uh, allows me to, when I, hose off inside the locker allows me to clean the line off the the grit off of the um off the uh, rope uh, or line part of my road uh as well as the chain so uh but most important is to move the chain over to the side so it doesn't stack up and it, a lot of people are asking on there too just about the everybody's worried about the swing right you get into right. the anchorage it's the other boats around you how you know they're they're basically saying how do you can how do you uh consider or figure in the expected swing circle of the other boats you know when you go to do it how did you yeah you know what's your typical measurement or what how far away are you trying to stay from those other boats regardless of what their swing might be yeah and that i was hoping that question did not come up because that's a hard <laughs> one to answer the the uh but uh there's uh Something I did not include, and this might be a little complicated, but it helps answer that question. Theoretically, all, uh, all the boats swing around together, so you could be anchored fairly close to them. Uh, but um, so part of that answer is to drop your anchor. Uh, if there's a couple of boats, uh, drop it be, uh, astern of those boats. And in the in right directly in between those two boats is where you drop it. And theoretically, you, you all swing around together. I have found like um, uh, motor boats and sailboats seem to swing a little differently. So I really try to keep that whole area clear so I could swing around in a circle and not hit another boat. Um, but you don't always have that luxury. So uh, yeah, so if we know my example on this, uh, I used 160 feet. I try to keep a complete circle so I could swing around 160 feet without uh, hitting any other boats in that area, even if they stayed in the same spot. But understand when wind and current change and you swing around, the other boats will swing to some degree, uh, not exactly the same. More challenging is when there is no wind or current, which is very unusual, but you'll see boats just slowly um, drift around in a little bit different directions. So um, I think I've had a lot of confusion, but uh, basically I try to stay as far away from them as I can. However, understand that they will, uh, especially if there's significant wind and current, they will all swing around in the same direction you're swinging. So you really should not connect them. And I will say, I've never, I've never had that problem. Uh, I think about it a lot, but it, it truly never has been a problem. We've all swung uh, around uh, basically in circles together. Okay. Hey, Glenn <laughs> Kenny here. <laughs> uh, there's, a, there's a question about when you're anchoring versus anchoring and doing a stern tie. Um, if you're keeping that same uh, scope, do you, what, what would you recommend in that circumstance? Yeah, the, the one advantage of stern tying, and I do a lot of stern tying, is generally, not always, but generally, 
the uh, ocean floor is sloping up towards shore and you're anchoring towards shore. And so that actually uh, creates a smaller angle. So your, your line holds uh, better. Uh, if you can imagine that, you know, the angle of the, of the seafloor sloping up in the same direction, you're pulling your anchor line. Um, so it, it helps the anchor to stay set. To answer the question though, I use the exact same calculation, just knowing that that sloping seafloor uh, gives me advantage, um, an added advantage of having a smaller angle that the uh, anchor is being pulled on. So I use the same calculation, uh, but in most of the time, the anchor will be even more secure. It's just really critical when you're stern tied that your anchor does hold because if it doesn't, well, you know, your boat is attached to shore and you're at risk of having the, the boat swing uh, closer to shore than you want it to. So um, yeah, just use the same calculation. It's always worked for me. You can even let out more because generally you're by yourself uh, when you are, um, uh, or there's fewer boats in the area, fewer boats swinging around. So uh, you don't, you, you have the luxury of letting out more road. More is always better. If I'm in an anchorage and there's no other boats around, I'll do a scope of uh, probably 10 to one, uh, just to, so I don't even have to think about it. But when there's other boats around, you do have to be mindful that you, you, have, you gotta share that anchorage with other boats. Hey there, Glenn Tim. Hey, uh, can you give any advice on stern tying uh, solo? <laughs> yeah. I've been told that it's a myth. It can't be done, and uh, and I've 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 nearly proved that a couple of times, uh, depending on the situation. Uh, advice on stern tying: one is uh, the amount of stern tied line you need. Uh, people ask me that a lot, and the the answer is the amount you need is ten more feet than what you actually have because you'll be trying to get back to your boat and it's like, oh, you're just with almost within reach and you've run out of line because often the boat will drift off uh, in a different direction. Uh, but all joking aside, I use 600 feet because I'm usually walking up a beach uh, to find something to put the line around. I, I like using trees. Uh, the other thing is I like a line that's very slippery. I find one of the greatest challenges stern tying is getting the line to slide over the rocks and other things that are uh, scattered on the beach. So uh, I just use, it's inexpensive, it's strong. I just use a poly, polypropylene line, uh, making sure it slides is, is good, making sure you have enough, like say 600 feet seems to have worked pretty well for me. Uh, 610 would probably be even better. The, uh, and so, I, uh, uh, so that's uh, what I use. Um, and, and oh, the other thing for especially solo stern tying is that you need to make sure your stern tie is securely tied to the reel because if you have crew on the boat, they can cleat off that line after you get it out. If you don't have that crew on the boat, you're going to often be pulling all the line off the reel and you want to make sure it's well attached to the boat. So having your the stern tie spool of line securely attached to the boat and the line securely attached to the spool are, uh, are really important when you're solo uh, doing it. And then having everything ready to deploy is really important when you're doing it because uh, you need to get to shore and uh, get around a tree, get back in your boat, get uh, back to your boat before uh, your boat is drifted, you know, way off in the wrong direction. So. Uh, you do want to move fast. So I have my uh, dinghy deployed on those weaver davits, which work really well. The anchor line is already, or the stern line is already attached to my dinghy. Uh, oars are ready to go. So when I'm setting my anchor, all that is deployed. Uh, so as soon as I've anchored, set the anchor, I'm in the dinghy heading to shore uh, in order to get back to the boat before things have moved around too much. So. Uh, yeah, those those are a couple of things that I've learned over a lot of trial and error. Uh, that, what do you think about a forty three? You think that'd make it a little easier? Oh yeah, just put it into 
hold mode and uh yeah yeah 43 is so awesome i've i did some uh, anchor training on it uh one thing i will say about the 43 though just with any anchoring and it's a mistake i made is uh, when you set the anchor you want to set it with just running one of the pods not both of them we we said i didn't realize both pods were running uh, the captain was running it and uh we set that anchor so deep. I, I think it came out the China ocean on the other side of the world and it took forever for me to pull it back up. So uh, anyways, yeah, don't, don't overset the, uh, the anchor uh, using all four propellers, both rods, pods. So, uh, but yeah, having that uh, hold the position hole would be so awesome uh, with, uh, uh, with the 43. Uh and as long as you have good GPS signal, I, I wouldn't want the boat going off on its own. But uh, yeah, but it, it's really not that bad. I've I've kind of joked around here a little bit, but I've I've done it many many times in some rather challenging areas. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a good idea is to go practice in a real safe, easy location. Uh, and then uh, when you do get in a challenging location, it's it's that much easier. There, uh, there's definitely a lot, there's a lot of questions, but I'm trying to see which one without taking it. To, uh, do you see any on there, Jeff, that you've done a lot of anchoring that would uh, be a good one for Glenn to answer? Um, I think he's covered most of them one way or the other. Um... I think any of the other ones we can we can answer offline if we've missed any. Let's see. As a courtesy income, does it make a boomy attached thing? Oh yeah. So one question here is, you know how um, people attach buoys to where their anchor is actually set, uh, so that incoming boaters uh, know where to put, set their anchors. Do you do that, Glenn? Uh, I, I have, and it depends on the situation. I found most times I'm stern tie. Uh, there are not a lot of anchors nearby. I know in the uh, desolation, if you have nice rings along there, yes, then it would be real important. But when I'm, uh, yeah, quite often there's not a lot of other boats around. Uh, and, and setting it as a trip line, that is attaching that buoy to the uh, backside, to the back of the blade of your uh, uh, anchor is a good idea because when you're that close to shore, especially when you go far north in the Pacific Northwest here anyways, uh, there's there's uh, logging cables and whatnot close to shore. So uh, so then it serves two purposes. People can see your uh, where your anchor is and you have a trip line attached. Um, you want to make sure you have plenty of line you've let out for, to accommodate for tide because you don't want your trip line to actually accidentally be <laughs> pulling your anchor up. The other thing I did, uh, once I used a crab pot uh, buoy uh, for that purpose of marking it, and, and I had some guys come up to steal my crab. Uh, I Fortunately, it was on the boat, so don't use one of those red and white, and at least in this area, we use red and light uh, buoys. I happen to have one on my boat, because uh, if someone goes to take your crab, they're pulling up your anchor. And when you stern tight, that's that's not a good thing. So uh, yeah, so I've just used a white uh, marker that uh, and people have left it alone then. So anyways, but yeah, not a not a bad idea, especially if you think other people are gonna be coming nearby. Uh, because quite often it'll be on a little bit of an angle from from you know where where you've uh, you're attached uh, to shore. So yeah, good idea, especially if there's other boats going to be stern tying near you. Thank you. Do you have a stern tie? Did they talk about the recommended stern tie that you use? Oh uh, yeah, also, all I do is, uh, in fact, I just rigged one up for a friend. Um, just go and get the spool that line comes on from uh, any place to sell the line. They usually have a spool sitting around and then, uh, Uh oh. Are we are are we good? 
I see Jeff moving, but Jeff's on mute. <laughs> that, might, that might be our uh, signal that uh, that we're done here today. So. Hey, <laughs> hey, Sam, do you, IT? Uh, um, a lot of people oh, help. Oh, there he is. <laughs> if you're if you're using that in uh, in desolation, it probably work. But generally, I found they're they're too short uh, for uh deploying in if you're do, trying to go up a beach and find a tree and go around it so make sure you have enough line on it and like i say just those plastic spools that the uh that line comes on uh you want them really large uh, uh to accommodate all the line that you have and uh or make sure they're large enough to accommodate all the line you have and uh and they're inexpensive and I've been using them for years and it works really well. I do the same well, thing. I just uh, leave the line on the spool and it's easy to, to wind back up. And like you said, make sure the spool is attached to the boat. Really well. uh, yep. So that uh, it comes off the spool easily and it's easy to, to roll it back up. So. Yeah. All right. Any other questions, yeah. Andrew? Uh, the only, I didn't see the part. Do you have a special anchor retrieval device that you're using? Someone was asking if you could share that with the group that's uh, watching um, or maybe put a link yeah. to it or something. Yeah, it's funny. I, uh, I'm i getting ready for my trip north uh, uh, to Alaska and I put it on, I forget the name of it, but I just took it off. I was concerned that it would interfere with uh, with actually setting the anchor. So I'm back to a trip line on the back of the anchor. The other thing they do is, uh, and I am taking one along, is uh, it's a foot and a half a chain that I can just wrap around the road up on the boat, uh, attach a line to it and drop it down. It should go over the shank of the anchor. And then uh, uh, just uh, use my dinghy, I can pull it in the opposite direction to help unstick uh, an anchor. So a trip line um, the uh, is a uh, works well. Make sure you set enough line out. Uh, having a device you can slide down the chain, the uh, anchor road, uh, in order to be able to pull your anchor in the opposite direction is uh, another alternative. I forget the name of the one I bought. They're a little pricey, and I've used them, and it, it works. Uh, but uh, uh, and, and what it does is it stays permanently attached um, down right next to your anchor. There's a chain that goes to the uh, backside of the anchor and you send a little, uh, they call it a messenger down your line. Uh, when you, it attaches to that device and pull up and I can't quite, rem I don't remember the, the name of it. It's actually on my boat right now, otherwise I'd look for it. Uh, but uh, I can send it out. It does work. I just, it does, I'm a little concerned with it um, because I'm going to be in some real challenging anchorages. I'm a little concerned with it interfering with my ability to anchor. So you want to be mindful, whatever system you use, be mindful that it's it's not going to cause any drag or get caught on rocks while you're trying to set the anchor. Okay. Glenn, thank you for uh, digging deep there. and. Uh... Have a great trip to Alaska this summer. Oh, well, dude, yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm jealous. I look forward to the day when I have enough time to to do that also. Yeah, so. I got four months, you know. Yeah, yeah I, okay. I recommend, uh, I, obviously, I recommend Ranger Tugs, but maybe even more than that, I recommend retirement, man. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank right. you, Glenn. That's awesome. Right. Nice we all forward. appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, right. Okay. See you guys. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Okay. All right. See you later. Yep. Bye bye.